Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to the Commission for inviting me to uh, speak to you all. It's been a great program so far. Um, I see we've got three sessions this afternoon without a break. It's going to be intense. Um, I'll try and sort of uh, abbreviate mine a bit, but they're going to reward you with alcohol at the end, I believe. Um, now, I uh, have been given a particular topic to talk about, and it's a, a data-driven uh, topic, so it's going to potentially sound a little academic. Um, but I want to emphasise that behind all the numbers and the, the data I present, there are people. And um, I do work and run a, a PTSD clinic for 30 years, so we're constantly seeing people, veterans, first responders and others, you know, who've been through trauma and dealing with PTSD or grief. And so I'm very, very aware that these aren't just numbers, they're people. And I think we've been made very aware of that so far today. And I think uh, Gwen's talk in particular, I think, was incredibly powerful. And not just was it brave, but I think what you said was incredibly wise. So it actually gels with a lot of the data as well. Now, I was surprised when I was given this topic. I didn't choose it. Um, I was given it um, on the complexity of assessing and treating post-concussive syndrome um, or traumatic brain injury, as against PTSD. And I was a bit surprised by this because um, one of the points I'm going to make in this talk is that um, it got me thinking about why does this matter in Australia in the context of suicide commission? And that's one of the issues I'm going to address today. And... I'll give you a heads up to what my take home message is in case you then after lunch want to doze off and that's fair enough. But essentially the message I'm going to give is that I don't think the issue of mild traumatic brain injury is as big as everybody makes out it is. Um, hopefully that's piqued your interest and you might stay away a few minutes longer. What I'd like to do is start off with some definitions because this area is muddied with definitions. Um, talk a bit about the issue about PTSD versus traumatic brain injury. And then I want to talk about some practical issues about assessment and treatment. And I do think that the reason uh, this topic was brought up is, is twofold. Number one, if we look at a, a, um, a lot of the big uh, studies that have been reported, um, sometimes population studies, they do tell us that people with a mild traumatic brain injury um, are far more likely to be at suicidal risk than people without a traumatic brain injury. We also know, particularly from overseas data, that particularly since the Middle East conflicts, that um, thanks to IEDs in particular, that traumatic brain injuries and particularly mild ones, um, were highly prevalent and highly problematic in certain militaries. So given those two bits of information, why do I think it's not the be-all and end-all? And, and let me sort of explain that a bit. First of all, some definitions. When we talk about mild traumatic brain injury, um, we're talking about an event. Um, we're not talking about a disorder. We're not talking about an illness um, in a sense. It's an event that happens. It's an insult to the brain. It's usually diffuse or closed head injury as distinct from a piercing one that, that penetrates a very focal part of the brain. Um, there's transient loss of consciousness, less than 30 minutes. Um, and my disorientation, which is in hospitals normally measured with something called the Glasgow Scale, the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, has a score, and there are very standard ways that we have to do it, and this particular score indicates that there is mild and transient um, impaired um, consciousness. And then the capacity to which my memory is interfered, as I can't encode things and then remember them again, which is very common in that acute phase, um, that, that period goes on for less than a day. And for many years, we've used this as like the demarcation point between a mild traumatic brain injury and a more moderate or severe one. 
And if any of these parameters are, are longer than those, then it tends to fall into the moderate and severe TBI. And we know that the more severe the TBI, the, the worse the impacts um, cognitively. Now, the important thing is that mild traumatic brain injuries account for more than 90% of brain injuries worldwide. Now, we have this other thing called post-concussive syndrome. Now, post-concussive syndrome is sometimes erroneously uh, used interchangeably with mild TBI, and it's a different thing. Because post-concussive syndrome could be a sequelae, could be some of the um, problems that I may or may not have after a mild TBI. And many people will have a mild TBI and not really have significant post-concussive syndromes. I've tried to add up how many mild TBIs I've had, and I stopped at about 10, because then it started to get embarrassing. But, you know, with sports injuries and those sorts of things and knocks to the head, many people have had mild TBIs, but most of us don't have marked post-concussive syndrome. It, it's an amorphous bunch of symptoms, such as fatigue, dizziness, concentration and memory problems, headaches, insomnia, irritability, and very, even very sensitive to light or sound. Um, and, and these are, are common in the sense of the aftermath. And then we have PTSD, which I'm assuming most people here know what PTSD is, given the, the nature of this meeting. You know, it's more or less an anxiety disorder, but it's characterised by intrusive memories and avoidance of a very, very traumatic experience. Now, the whole issue of mild TBI has been a huge issue since the Middle East conflict. Um, we saw a big rise in it in many studies um, in certain militaries, those people deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, and many people termed mild traumatic brain injury as the signature injury of the war, which was a big call given what was happening in terms of amputations and, and, and other you know, problems that were emerging. But it was highly, highly prevalent because of the nature of the conflicts that many people had. Now, let me jump in here and say that in terms of Australian Defence Forces exposure um, on its deployments, yes, we did have troops that were ex um, exposed to IEDs and did sustain uh, mild TBIs on deployment, but nowhere near the number um, that was sustained by the Americans, for example. And I do think we need to keep that in context. That's not to minimise the impact on people who did sustain a mild TBI, but um, we do need to put that into a context. Now, when I started up in, out in this field, it, we were all taught that after a mild TBI, you can't develop PTSD. It just can't happen. And it can't happen simply because if I get knocked out, then how do I encode this horrible stuff that I'm going through? The, the traumatic experience that I've gone through, I don't really take it in. It doesn't become encoded in my memory. And in a sense, that's protective against developing PTSD. And right up through to the 80s, this was actually quite a prevailing view in, in psychiatry and in neurology. But as the data started to emerge, um, we started to realise that actually wasn't true. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a study that we did here in Australia. First of all, not with military, but we did a study with a bunch of people in different states where we looked at um, over 1,000 patients who were admitted to hospitals and in any emergency department, um, more than half of people will have sustained a mild TBI. It's the nature of being in car accidents and, and assaults. It's very common. Typically, they don't get assessed and picked up because everyone's far too worried about more severe life-threatening injuries, and that's what the docs rightly focus on. But we assess them in hospital, then we assess them three months later and 12 months later, we assess them on a whole bunch of factors, including a very full assessment of their level of TBI. Now, just to give you a snapshot of um, what psychological disorders they had at 12 months, you can see there that um, depression was the most common, but PTSD was there in 10% of people, and 
across the anxiety disorders, they were pretty well represented. But what I want you to focus on is what happens when we break this down into people with a mild traumatic brain injury and those without a brain injury. And rather, contrary to the traditional view, what we see here is that actually having a mild traumatic brain injury increases your risk for developing PTSD. Now, when we control for all other factors, such as the level of injury, the type of trauma you've been through, even controlling for all of those things, you are one and a half times more likely to develop PTSD if you were going to develop, um, if you had a mild TBI, and you're also significantly more likely to develop social phobia or generalised anxiety if you'd cop that injury. So these people certainly are more at risk. When we looked at how much impairment these people had at 12 months, that is, how much was it just getting into the way of basic functioning, so physical functioning and social functioning, if you look at the top line there, if you look at what impact just mild TBI had, it virtually had no impact at all on people's capacities to function. But then if you looked at people who had mild TBI and PTSD, then it was tenfold their likely um, impairment. And same with depressions, um, same with anxiety. So if we put in these sort of comorbid psychological problems, the likelihood of me having impairment after my brain injury just goes up and up and up. Now, why is this? Well, there's a number of reasons, possibly. We really don't know for sure, to be honest. But whenever, we know that there's a lot of evidence that with PTSD, the way we, we function is that there's a part of the brain around here, it's like in the, what we call the medial prefrontal cortex, and it's really important for how we adapt after a trauma because that part of the brain sort of regulates a lot of our emotion and it's, it helps someone cope after trauma. And we know that people who develop PTSD aren't able to activate that part of the brain as well as people who don't have PTSD. Problem is, that's the very part of the brain that's often affected in a mild TBI. Because often what happens in lots of injuries, particularly where the brain gets thrown back and forward inside the skull, it sort of shears against the, the, the skull, and it's that part of the brain that gets damaged. And so it could be in mild TBI, the very part of the brain that we need functioning to adapt after trauma is compromised. Now that's speculative, we don't know this for sure. But there's also the possibility that it's just driven by how we think. Because we know that how anybody adapts after a traumatic experience is driven enormously by how they interpret the event. How traumatic it was, how did I personally behave in that experience, and how do I see the world ahead of me? How dangerous is my environment going forward? Now they've got to bring a lot of cognitive resources to that. Now, it is possible that mild TBI compromises that because it can compromise some of my attentional capacity and maybe they aren't able to use those strategies as well. Again, that's speculative. Now, this becomes even a cloudier picture when we consider post-concussive symptoms because We've done this in a few studies now where we've looked at people in hospital and also we've followed them up over months later. And we've looked at people that sustained a mild TBI and we looked at people who did not. And we've assessed them on a whole bunch of measures including post-concussive syndrome and um, PTSD. And basically when you look at how commonly we find post-concussive syndrome, it's identical between people who do and don't get a mild TBI. Now, we had a bugger of a time ever publishing this data because we were always getting reviewed by neurologists who would say, well, you've, you've misunderstood it because you can't have those symptoms because the person didn't have um, a mild TBI. Now, that's actually ridiculous because the person is saying, I have this symptom. All we're debating about now is what is the cause. And what we're seeing here is that it's just as likely 
in people with and without a TBI. Now, how can that be? Well, um, we, break, break, we break it down into people who also then had PTSD and did not have PTSD. And we see that the people who had PTSD, they're the ones that had much greater concentration deficits, dizziness, headaches, visual disturbance. And so when we actually put it all into the mix, we think what predicts post-concussive syndrome months down the track is actually not mild TBI. What predicts it is how much physical pain I'm in and how much PTSD I have. That's what's driving my post-concussive syndrome. All right, that's all civilian stuff. What do we know about the military? Well, basically, it's a very similar story. Um, a guy called Charles Hoag um, created a furor um, back in 2008 when he published this huge study on um, US troops coming back from Iraq where he looked at a large sample, 2,500. Um, and at the time, the US had um, put in enormous policies on mild TBI. They'd invested heavily into it because they believed it was a signature injury. And basically, Charles blew all that out of the water because he found that even though like 44% did have PTSD and 27% had mild TBI because it was very common with all the IEDs at the time. What he also found was that post-concussive syndrome and also people's general health was not associated with mild TBI at all. The level of um, symptoms people were having was driven simply by PTSD and depression. We did another study that was longitudinal where we actually got into um, work with colleagues at, at Bagram um, in Afghanistan, which is a major US base. And at the time they were doing very good assessments of um, TBI. As soon as anybody got ex within so many meters of an IED, they were medevaced um, to this particular center where we could do very intensive um, assessments of them. And Basically, everybody that um, was within a blast uh, got assessed. And essentially what we found there was what predicted the post-concussive syndrome was mild TBI did, but again, the big factor was PTSD. So even in the acute setting in the battlefield, the PTSD is a major, major player. Now, how do we understand this? This is a bit of an unpopular view in some quarters, and particularly sort of people who take a very medical, biological view. But one of the, one of the views that I favour is something that post-concussive sy symptoms, whilst there obviously is a, an element of it that's neurologically based, it can actually be seen as a bit of a cognitive disorder in much the same way as we understand health anxiety or panic disorder. Years ago, things like panic disorder was understood as a form of um, respiratory problems. And there was lots of major theories about that. But we know now that that's not the case. And that really what drives a person to panic is how they're interpreting those symptoms. So it's when I'm having rapid breath, when my heart is beating, etc. I then instantly, and I mean pre-consciously, jump to conclusions and make appraisals that I'm having a heart attack, that I'm going crazy. That's what drives the sense of panic and leads to panic disorder. It's very possible that we're seeing a similar type thing with mild TBI, because people are having very common type symptoms that people have after these experiences and very common in PTSD because of the high arousal in PTSD causes a lot of these issues. And it's how I'm interpreting that. If I interpret it in the framework of, I have a brain injury, something permanently bad has happened to my brain, and that's what's causing these symptoms, then I will get very anxious about it, and I will pay more and more attention to it. And this created a lot of concern amongst people in the aftermath of the Middle East conflicts, that we were creating a cohort of veterans who were believing this narrative. 
And it was a bit reminiscent of what um, was often referred to as the Gulf War Syndrome, where in that context, when there was so much discussion and publicity about weapons of mass destruction, so many people who were over there were developing these medically unexplained symptoms, but they were attributing it to the weapons of mass destruction, to toxic gases, etc. And they were coming up with this whole syndrome and believing it, and it was actually very, very impairing. In reality, we know that the evidence for that as a syndrome didn't hold out. And in fact, many of the symptoms they have are very understandable symptoms by being in the desert, inhaling all the, the dust, etc., with the equipment they were wearing. But the idea that it was attributable to weapons of mass destruction for the huge numbers of people who were presenting with this problem wasn't borne out. And it's possible that a similar thing is, could have, was happening a decade ago with the mild TBI story, that people were having these common reactions because of stress, but attributing it to brain injury. And the problem with that is when you attribute it to brain injury, a lot of veterans then think, I have a permanent disorder. My brain is damaged. And that can actually be a very maladaptive self-appraisal to make. And it doesn't give you a lot of optimism about your future. What about suicidality? Well, there has been studies, again, done with mild TBI and um, suicidality. But again, most of these are done without considering the stress response. But one study very recently looked at a, a cohort of US troops, and they looked at a range of suicidality indices. Um, and essentially what this study found, and this only just came out, this study, um, is that the people who had, um, this is looking at, well, this, you can see here, it's got uh, lifetime and uh, current suicidal ideation. Um, but the people who had the mild TBI and the PTSD, they were the greatest at risk. And again, it tells you that really what we need to be focusing on here is the psychological reaction. That's compounding whatever other effects we're having. So if people are actually going to be at greater suicidal risk, it's not just down to mild TBI. We have to be considering the psychological factors. And when they actually did a more nuanced analysis and they looked at when we look at all suicidal risk in this cohort, what's predicting that suicidal risk? It's the PTSD. The TBI did not have any predictive function at all. Now, I should make a comment about moderate and severe TBI. This is going to be really rare in our circles, but it does happen. And to be honest, it, it tends to happen with more severe um, accidents, which are more likely to, to be honest, happen in training and events such as that. And essentially what a severe you know, TBI is, is where I'm really knocked out for quite a period of time. And there's sustained uh, loss of consciousness and this post-traumatic amnesia where I just can't keep encoding and retaining information goes on for more than a day. And this has traditionally been seen as there is no way you can get PTSD in this condition. But we looked at nearly 100 patients. I used to work in a brain injury clinic. And we just looked at 100 patients with severe brain injury after um, severe TBI. And the mean post-traumatic amnesia of this sample was over a month. So we're talking about people with total amnesia of what they'd been through. Now, the vast, vast majority had been through severe car accidents. Anyway, we assessed them six months after their injury. And basically, we did find that over 20% of this sample had PTSD. Now, how the hell is that possible? They don't remember their accident or their, their, their trauma. Well, yes, they, very, they really did not have memories as such. They didn't have flashbacks. But what they did have, typically, is if there was a reminder of what they've been through, then they basically had panic attacks and intense distress, and they didn't know why. So in the case of a veteran who might have had severe TBI, 
it could just be that at a barbecue, the smell of um, you know, burning steak might actually just be a trigger somehow. And he doesn't know why. Or it could just be a car backfiring. And he doesn't know why that's triggering a memory. But it does. And it causes then subsequent panic, etc. Now, again, there's multiple reasons why this might be the case. And I'm not going to bore you with um, these that are a bit esoteric. But suffice to say that even in these people, the PTSD can occur. We shouldn't just say it doesn't. Now, if we turn to um, assessment issues, one of the great conundrums here is, this is what I was meant to talk about, I've only taken 30 minutes to get there, um, is how do you do a differential diagnosis? How do you tease out between the person's symptoms of concentration, problems and all the rest of it are actually PTSD or um, post-concussive syndrome? Well, the reality is, most of these symptoms exist in both conditions. Amnesia, concentration def deficits, irritability, fatigue, uh, bad sleep, uh, dissociation. And by dissociation, I mean I have um, poor attentional focus and I sort of space out now and then. That's, that can be there in both. And just being agitated and highly aroused can be there in both. Now, there's been numerous commentaries over the years about what are the telltale signs that we can really rely on to tease out whether it's neurologically caused or whether it's psychologically caused, because that would help us you know, decide whether it's PTSD or TBI. There's no evidence that we, we can do any of this, because these symptoms are just so similar. Um, the amnesia is just very difficult to dif differentiate. Um, what I would say, if there is de demonstrable loss of consciousness at the time of the trauma, then there's a good, then the person had mild TBI. And very often it, it is documented somehow. Then TBI was probably present. But that's not to say that PTSD is not also present. Concentration memory deficits, there's really no way to differentiate them irritability, fatigue, sleep disturbance, dissociation. There are no really solid ways we can differentiate between them because their symptoms are actually cited, they actually comprised both constructs. So we're left then with saying, well, what do we do with an assessment? How do we call one you know, versus the other? I tend to sidestep that whole issue by then saying, um, does it matter? Um, th the key I think we've got to understand is, does the person have PTSD? And yeah, that's quite simple, because whatever brain injury they've got, we look out for key PTSD symptoms. So if the person does have intrusive memories or nightmares, if they're avoiding reminders, if they're agitated, you know, associated with those reminders, then PTSD is there, and we have to address it. Now, what impact does this have on treatment? Well, actually, let me uh, come back to that. Let me just talk you, uh, t tell you about a, a very brief study that I did a number of years ago, because it's amazing, given all the fuss about PTSD and mild TBI, we actually don't have a good evidence base on how to treat it. So a few, quite a few years ago, I did a study where we looked at uh, our normal trauma-focused cognitive behaviour therapy, which is the gold standard for treating PTSD. And the core for that treatment is actually you ask the patient to re relive um, their trauma memory. So they have to go over it, and they go over it again and again. And we know through an enormous number of studies that this is a really effective way in most people to reduce their PTSD symptoms, as well as other strategies we teach them. Now, how do you do that with mild TBI? Well, we did a study, and it was actually more of an early intervention study, where we used these um, strategies, which are the standard ones we use. Um, cognitive therapy is essentially we 
teach them to think realistically about how they're thinking about themselves and their trauma and to sort of have an evidence-based rather than a gloom and doom appraisal of what they've been through in their future. And their prolonged exposure is what I mentioned. It's reliving the trauma memory. But with people with mild TBI, we get them to focus on whatever traumatic in, uh, memory they have. So for some of them had had sort of transient loss of consciousness. They might have been knocked out, but they could remember the paramedics um, bringing them back to base. Or it could be waking up in the emergency department um, and not knowing how I got there. But I do remember that, and that was really painful and scary, and that was actually a very traumatic memory. Or for some people, they actually don't remember it, but they were having horrible dreams about it. We would use those dreams as a source of focusing on the, the memory, and we would just do the reliving to that. And basically what we did was we uh, did this study, and bottom line is, at six months, what we did was we randomised people to either the normal therapy or to supportive counselling. And this is a study that we've shown numerous times before where we got exactly the same effect for treating people with mild TBI as we did if they never had a TBI. And we, did ex we didn't change the treatment at all. So it was equally effect as effective. Now, I'm just going to go back to say then what impact does this have on treatment? I think the message for any clinician who's treating somebody um, with PTSD, uh, with a mild TBI, is look for PTSD. And if it's there, we want to focus on treating the PTSD and don't get too fussed about the mild TBI. In fact, I would let downplay the long-term impact because the number of people that have come to my clinic or the number of phone calls I field from around the country from very concerned people saying, look, my son or my husband, you know, was in Afghanistan, um, you know, sustained a mild TBI, and so, you know, he's, he's going to be stuffed the rest of his life. And that's actually a false prognosis because we know from a lot of the evidence that the major driver of somebody's functioning is not going to be whether they had a mild TBI or not. It's the stress reaction, the depression, etc. And the same applies for suicidality. Now, that's the good news because we have good evidence that these things are modifiable. There are things we can do about it. There's not a hell of a lot we can do about a mild TBI because, as I said, that's just an event that happened. But if someone's having a stress reaction or a psychological reaction that's driving these functional problems, we know what we can do about that. There are things we can do. And that's the message we want to give people. And let's focus on that. And importantly, we want to communicate an expectancy of recovery. You want to instill optimism in the person that this is not a sentence. This is actually you know, good news and we know what to do about it. Now let me sort of qualify some of these comments. I know I've been very black and white about this issue of um, it's all PTSD, but let me say that the, the role of mild TBI is still a factor and it's qualified a bit by, it does depend on the number of mild TBIs a person has. The more you have, the more influential it becomes and the interval between them is actually quite influential. And that's why we have all the sports codes now having very strict policies that you need so much time before you can go back to the game, you know, since your last um, episode of concussion. Because they don't want people having exposure to a TBI um, when it's too recent. The brain basically they, needs to recover. And also there's some evidence, not overwhelming, but the blast injuries may have some sort of distinctive value neurologically. It's, it's, the research is not overwhelming. But despite those qualifications, I would still say that overwhelmingly, we do need to emphasise the psychological aspect of this, particularly in the context of Australian exposure to IEDs and to TBIs, 
But this is a talk I would give in America or the UK um, or anywhere else where the same message um, you know, applies. Because all the evidence is really telling us that the best way we're going to help people, help veterans, is by helping them deal with things psychologically. And we don't need to wrap ourselves up in knots about post-concussive syndrome, mild TBI or PTSD. And I think the last comment I would make is that um, Oh yeah. We also just want to focus, let's not get hung up by the labels. This is something else I find a lot in our field. People sort of focus on PTSD or they fo focus on mild TBI. They're just diagnoses and in a sense they're, they're a guide but what you want to do as a clinician is you want to focus on the presenting problem. And if you have a veteran who's actually presenting and they're, they're really suicidal or they're really depressed or they've got PTSD, We've got evidence, we've got strategies to help deal with those things. Focus on that. Don't focus on the diagnosis and the entire label because we're putting that person in a box. And if there's one thing we've learned is that that is just dumb. You know, the person's an individual with a particular set of problems in a particular context, you know, with their own family or their own social problems or whatever. We deal with those issues, but we've got evidence to drive what we do as clinicians. And on that point of evidence, I just want to emphasise again that we do need to be listening to the evidence. And I think, you know, what uh, Christine said this morning is right, that we do need um, top-down policy initiatives from government, from all of government. But contingent on that is that government is listening to the evidence. Because all over the world, I deal with agencies and governments where people with the best interests are initiating all sorts of programs for veterans. And particularly, you know, with a decade ago it was more mild TBI, but now people are doing it with suicidality, which is good. But we need to be listening to the evidence about really what is effective. And the reality is, and it's not a, this is not you know, a pleasant thing to hear, but the overall evidence that we currently have about uh, suicide risk detection and suicide prevention, I'm not just talking about in the military veteran world, I'm talking about generally, is not great. We have a long way to go as a discipline in understanding how do we really identify who's at risk and then what do we, it's the best way to really manage that. And we do need a lot more focused research to be able to um, do that. Now, I do agree that we have to do things now, but we also need to recognise that we just can't do those things and feel good about it. We do have a responsibility to keep doing smart research to understand really what is the best way we can um, achieve the goals we're getting, which is obviously you know, preventing suicide. But again, I, I very much endorse what Christine said this morning that it's not just suicide, it's getting people earlier on. Because for every suicide, how much anguish and emotional distress do people go through to get to that point? And that's where we need to get in and that's where we need to target. But we're not very good at doing it. And we do need better, better strategies. And we need to keep reminding ourselves we don't know a lot at the moment. And by reminding ourselves about that, um, it keeps us motivated and curious. As my wife always tells me, she comes from Eastern Europe where they've got all these bizarre sayings. I don't know where she pulls them from, but she says, um, we learn every day, but we still die stupid. <laughs> Which is not exactly very encouraging, but that's Eastern Europe for you. Um, but it's sort of true. And I think sort of, you know, what we're talking about here, it, it does reflect sort of where we're at. And we need to keep striving for greater and greater knowledge. But in terms of what we do know, I still think we still need to be upbeat about this issue about TBI and PTSD, highlight expectancy, and let's get in and modify and treat the things we can.